And now I'd like to kick off the program with an introduction of Mark Simon, who will be one of our moderators today, along with um, Assemblymember Mullen. Mark is the Chief of Staff of the San Mateo County Transit District. Um, he has been a longtime journalist in San Mateo County, as we all know. Um, he was worked with the Chronicle and some and the, some of the other local papers. But he gave up journalism, he says, to join Samtrans in 2004. And uh, he is also a stable of of the event of of the uh, of of our progress seminar, especially with the Sunday morning. So please welcome Mark and Kevin and Jerry and Phil. Phil should be on the left. Maybe I can hear. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I could have sworn I said good morning already. Jerry said Phil should be sitting on the left, and that's probably correct. Uh, it's a well. Listen harder. Um, good morning. I'm Mark Simon, and he's Kevin Mullen. Welcome to a special edition of the game coming to you from these a closing general session of the 2017 Progress Seminar arranged by the River City San Mateo County Chamber of Commerce. And thank you to our general session sponsor, uh, Sequoia Hospital Dignity Health. Uh, our topic for this morning's panel is, we've never seen anything like this before, bobbing, weaving, and adapting with the Trump administration. I don't know how many of us are adapting. Um, Kevin? So to the surprise of millions of Americans, perhaps including himself, Donald Trump was elected our 45th president in 2016, winning the Electoral College vote by a margin of 302 to 232 for Hillary Clinton, but losing the national popular vote by nearly 3 million votes, a margin that was supplied largely by California, where he lost the popular vote by more than 4 million votes. April 30th will mark President Trump's 100th day in office, and we have not seen the first 100 days of such activity since the first term of Franklin Roosevelt with decidedly different results. Far from shunning controversy and confrontation, President Trump has appeared to seek it out and savor the confusion and dismay and consternation of both his friends and his enemies. Recently, in one 48-hour period, he reversed several of his core campaign positions. He has brought a new boldness to financial conflicts of interest and he has noted that health care is more complicated than people think. <laughs> I kind of had to laugh at that one. A Gallup poll six days ago found that 45% of Americans think Trump keeps his promises down from 17, uh, point, down 17 points from 62% in February. Among Republicans, the drop was 11 points. Among conservatives, about nine points. But all in all, he's pretty much held his base. There is a new Washington Post ABC News poll. He's at 42% approval which is a low uh, in these modern times for a president this early uh, in their administration. So as the title of our panel indicates, we are in unchartered political territory. To talk about how we got here and uh, where we might go next, <laughs> like they know. <laughs> That's why you're the experts, so we've invited you. Uh, we have invited two of California's most respected political journalists to give us their thoughts about the current political environment. Now note I said respected, not respectful. Oh, uh, respectable. I know. <laughs> <laughs> You're in for a morning of uh, sharp, uh, sharp witted, and irreverent and forceful commentary. Uh, Phil Trounstein and Jerry Roberts are co founders and co editors of CalBuzz, a political website. Their slogan is shooting the wounded since 2009. Uh, the Washington Post said CalBuzz is the best nonpartisan website covering California politics. A graduate of San Jose State University, go Spartans. Phil Trounstein was a political editor and reporter for the San Jose Mercury News for 20 years, a must-see reporter on the evolution of Silicon Valley as a statewide and national political force. He left the Merck to serve as communications director for Governor Gray Davis and then founded and ran the Survey and Policy Research Institute of San Jose State before launching CalBuzz with Jerry in 2009. He's co-author of Movers and Shakers, The Study of Community Power. Please welcome Phil Trounstein. Thank you. Golf 
Jerry Roberts is former managing editor of the San Francisco Chronicle. He had the misfortune of being my boss for a while, uh, where he also had a long career as a lead political reporter, as well as positions as editorial page editor and the city editor, former editor and publisher of the Santa Barbara News Press, where he engaged in a fight for journalistic ethics, which I'd encourage you to research, because this was a fascinating fight about somebody who was determined to destroy her own newspaper. Um, he won several national awards, um, many of them for journalistic ethics, and is chronicled in the documentary film Citizen Macaw. He is the author of Never Let Them See You Cry, a biography of Senator, the, the definitive biography of Senator Dianne Feinstein. Please welcome Jerry Roberts. I, I think we want to get started with um, looking back just a little bit. Um, how did Trump win? And I don't, I don't mean that facetiously. How did he pull this off? Did he win, or how much of it was that Hillary managed to lose? Um, let's start with you, Jim. Well, first of all, thanks for, for having us uh, here, um, Mark. Uh, uh, Mark was introduced as someone who gave up uh, journalism a few years ago, and I can assure you we gave it up long before that. <laughs> And I, I also want to thank Kevin for, for inviting us. I, I was uh, at opening day and saw Kevin throw out the, the first pitch, actually, on Giants opening day. And the uh, radar guns in our section had it at 22 miles an hour. So, that's my district number. That's, that's like, so with, 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 was it, was a change up. With Baumgartner gone, it's, there, there is truth to the rumor Bochy is seeking him out. Um, <laughs> And then I also want to thank all of you for coming. Mark didn't tell you, but when you cover a political convention in California, a weekend convection, the person who is slated, or the persons who are slated to talk at this time is known as the hangover slot. <laughs> uh, so I really want to uh, say we appreciate being, being scheduled into this time, first of all, and, and secondly, thank you all for coming either on your way to church or home from the party last night. Uh, now, as to Trump, uh, oh, yeah. I'm going to let Phil talk about the politics. I want to I want to focus on the media a little bit first because I think the way the race was covered uh, was obviously hugely important, and and there is a lot to the mechanics and and what else was going on. Um, but the media did some extraordinary things. Um, a Pew Research poll taken uh, right at the end of the campaign showed that the number one source for people to, who were following the campaign to get their information was cable news, 25%, far and above everything else. The second was uh, social media, Facebook and other social media, about 14%. And then came uh, uh, local television, also 14%. <clears throat> Comedy shows were 9%, local newspapers were 3%, and national newspapers were 2%. So that was part of it. People got their news essentially from cable news. Of that group, but far and away the largest was Fox News, which was followed by 20% of all voters, 40% of Trump voters. So Fox played a, a, an outsized um, role in the campaign. So that was one issue. The other is that cable together provided Trump over a billion dollars of free advertising uh, in the way that they covered his campaign rallies, in the way that they let him call into their shows and so on. Totally unprecedented. Uh, and then the third issue I would raise is I think there was this tremendous uh, uh, demonstration of what is called false equivalence, uh, where under the rules of journalism you have to say, uh, it is alleged uh, that Mark is a mass murderer. Uh, Mark denies the charge. Well, obviously he is a mass murderer, so allowing him to have a say is, is not, not the idea. But there was this equivalence of Hillary's email scandal. And I, I would invite you to Google the phrase Clinton email scandal with everything else on the Trump side, the fact that he did not release his taxes, the fact that he had ripped people off through this Trump University thing, the fact that he shattered every single norm of political behavior for a major national candidate that had gone on since, uh, since we began electing presidents by popular vote. Um, so I think you know the need to uh, have so-called balance, every single story about Clinton um, included the, the email scandal. And, you know, not to say that there wasn't anything to it, but it was not equivalent 
to all of the other things that were on the <laughs> Trump side that I think suffered from being less covered. So, well, I just want to say that I had no comment on my being a mass murderer. <laughs> um, and uh, by the way, I, I, I didn't introduce Kevin. Does he really need to be introduced? No. Yeah. He uh, threw out the first pitch. What do you? <laughs> Don't let him do it. Phil. Okay. Do you all have pens and paper handy? If you, if you do, let me just. I want you to write something down. Write these numbers down. <laughs> you didn't know there'd be homework, did you? <clears throat> 5,353, 11,375, 22,147. And I'll do the math for you. These add up to 38,875. The first number <clears throat> is the margin of victory of Trump over Clinton in Michigan. The second is Wisconsin, and the third is Pennsylvania. They total 38,875. That's the difference <clears throat> between having Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump in the White House. That is fewer votes than the margin of difference than the margin in Riverside County, California where the margin was 40,452. So, yes, we have Donald Trump as President of the United States. Hillary Clinton did three, three big things happen, in, in my opinion. One, the Clinton campaign made horrific errors, including bad polling in the states that mattered, in, their, in the key states of Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and I would include Ohio. Instead, they were off trying to jack up the vote in Arizona and Georgia, which was ridiculous. They didn't need to win Arizona and Georgia. They needed to win their base states. Had they won the base states, this whole discussion of, of uh, is the Democratic Party off on the wrong foot, which maybe it is, um, wouldn't even be happening because Clinton would be in the White House. Three states. Um, so you've got bad campaign, not necessarily a bad candidate, but a, or even necessarily a bad message, not a great message. Clinton clearly didn't have a strong economic message uh, for, for the white middle class in America, and she could have, she sure have had a better one. Bad polling in those states by the Clinton campaign and by others. And then you've got Comey and the Russians. You take all those factors together, and you've got Clinton in the White House instead of Trump in the White House. Now, it's very difficult to understand this when you live in California, particularly if you live in the Bay Area. Mark, I think this is a good place to lay this out. Do you know what the margin of victory, do you, do you know what, the, what happened in San Mateo? How many of you live in San Mateo County? 98% of you live in San Mateo County? Okay, San Mateo County, 237,822 to 57,929. That's 76% of the vote for Hillary Clinton in San Mateo County. In Santa, in Santa Clara County, 73%. In San Francisco, 85%. We live in a different universe, a different universe you particularly, I think. <laughs> Santa Barbara County was only about 70%. So. Uh, uh, but we live in a different universe than, than, than the people who elected Donald Trump. Uh, the, the, the folks who voted for Trump are, are a tiny minority where we are. And it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that. And, I mean, in, in the legislature, What's the, what's the, how many Republicans are there in the, in the, in the Assembly and the Senate? Uh, I believe it's double digits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we have 55 Democrats yeah. and so, the 80-member Assembly. So, so super majority. What happened? What happened is Clinton ran a crappy campaign, Comey came along, and uh, the Russians hacked the election. That's my fundamental belief so about mechanically what happened. Can I ask you, there's... Um, the latest conventional wisdom is that we all sort of in, in our um, in the bubble, so to speak, thought this was going to be a referendum on Donald Trump 
that he was simply unfit, unqualified to serve in the office, when in reality it turned out to be a referendum on Hillary Clinton and what she represented as sort of the more established political figure. What do you, what do you think about that? Well, if you look back over the last 40 years, 30, 40 years, who are the two people who upset, you know, there's a normal cycle. You get eight years of Republicans, eight years of Democrats, eight years of Republicans, eight years of Democrats in the White House, okay? And there are two politicians who've upset that cycle. Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton, the two most gifted political campaigners of our time. Absolutely, and they upset, they upset that, the rhythm. That, that rhythm. Hillary Clinton had n simply couldn't possibly have those kind of qualities. The historical trend was for there to be a Republican, and Republicans vote for Republicans, by and large. But by that, by that logic, then Trump would be equivalent to Clinton and to Reagan for having upset the. Uh, it's, it's, do you think he is? I don't think he is, but I, uh, but I think he, he's a disruptor in in the way that they were disrupted. Well, I, th <laughs> I think the one thing we can describe uh, Donald Trump as is a disruptor. Um, <laughs> The, uh, he just tweeted, we're coming up on the first hundred days. He's watching this? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he's tweeting about it. Um, okay. he, uh, we're coming up on his first hundred days, as, as Kevin noted in the intro. He uh, tweeted yesterday, you know, that's a ridiculous standard to try to live up to. But he said it out there. Well, in fact, he, he published a list of the ten pieces of legislation he was going to introduce in his first hundred days. Um, and now his attitude is, well, we'll get to it uh, when we get to it. So, so what's your take on his first 100 days? Well, I mean, I think broadly, um, I mean, look, the, the president of the United States is supposed to be a uniter, or at least try to unite the country. And he's made absolutely no effort to do that, none. I mean, he uttered a few words on election night when he was surprised he won. But since then... <laughs> Everything that he has done has been to play to his base and to the right of his base, and in some cases, betraying his base, which we can talk about a little bit more. Um, but I think if you look at the norms for a president, you know, he's supposed to be the president of all the people. Trump evinces no interest in being the president of all the people. He wants to be the president of, of red America. Um, I think you have this corruption on an epic scale that's going on. He's running, you know, what can only be called a kleptocratic government <laughs> where, you know, his daughter, uh, you know, meets with the Chinese premier and then gets, you know, branding rights in China for his products, the same thing that happened to him. He doubles the rates at his country club, goes down there every week and then invites uh, anybody who wants to do business with the, co uh, the government to, to, to buy uh, a membership. 200,000. 200,000, he's in, put in place, you know, like-minded billionaires who have their own conflicts. Betsy DeVos, the, the head of the Department of Education, um, you know, has got guys who are in the private charter school business advising her. Her brother, you know, has a back channel connection to the Russians. So, um, you know, we haven't seen a government like this. Paul Krugman calls us one of the stands, Uzbekistan, Afghanistan, uh, you know, we're on, we're on that level. And then, you know, add to the fact that the guy is unhinged. I mean, you know, we, <laughs> seriously, we wrote a piece back in June of 2015 where we went to the, what is it called, what is that? DSM. The, the, the diagnostic manual for, um, uh, clinical <laughs> for, mental, for clinical psychologists, and we laid out all of the symptoms of narcissistic personality disorder, which are in there, which align perfectly with his behavior. So, you know, when you say, well, why did Donald Trump suddenly switch on Syria? And, you know, oh, is this some deep? No, this isn't the deep policy thing. It's because he felt like dropping a bomb on somebody, and his, and his daughter told him she saw weeping children on TV. So, his policies are really, you know, being formed by his personality and his need uh, for approval. So I would say in the broader sense, uh, things have not gone all that well. This, uh, this might be a good hey, time hey, to... Let me, let me just let me, let me interject one thing. Let me, let me interject something, because this might be the right time. 
I was watching Meet the Press. I know you guys are big fans of that show. And Peggy Noonan was on. I know you're huge <laughs> fans of hers. She won the Pulitzer Prize. Didn't I've you? heard that. Yeah. 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 But um, she said, you know, he, he never got a honeymoon. <laughs> well, I mean, it Neither doesn't. Neither did we. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, shouldn't he have had at least a, a chance to get a, a fresh start on his policy? No. Like, I, it's no. funny, getting no, a no. fresh start on his policies has never been a laugh line. Yeah, well, look, he's got the Senate, he's got the House, he's got the presidency. If he can't, and, and if he can't get it done, why not? I mean, when, the one thing I think you have to give, if you look at the first 100 days, you got Neil Gorsuch. You got Neil Gorsuch. And that is huge, as Bernie would say. Huge. Because it's a 40-year effect, and he's going to have how many? 330. 330 federal judges, if he ever gets around to, to appointing them. So, <clears throat> what, what happened in the first 100 days? He got Neil Gorsuch. Everything else, Donald, it, it, isn't it apparent that Donald Trump really didn't understand how government works? Because he thought that you could just sign something hold up the pretty picture of him signing the executive order, and he thought that that's how stuff got done, I think. Um, and so legislatively, that nothing's happening. So if you want to compare him to FDR, who invented the first 100 days, I mean, you got to remember, Trump was the one, there are millions of clips out there of Trump himself saying, in the first 100 days, we will do this. In the first 100 days, we'll do this, we'll do this. Day one, we'll do this. It's, he's the one who set this marker out there. Well, in the first 100 days, he'll have Neil Gorsuch, and that's really a function of Mitch McConnell, not Donald Trump, it seems to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I think he has accomplished, and, and the Gorsuch thing is huge. The, the New York Times study of the federal judiciary is about 900 judges, circuit judges, uh, and courts of appeals. Uh, is that he'll end up, there's a, over 100 vacancies now, largely because a lot of Obamas were blocked, but he'll end up being able to appoint about 38% of the federal judiciary, aside from any further um, Supreme Court justices he gets. Uh, and that's really the big, I mean, that's, that's the big story of the, of the first 100 days, I think. Huh. So uh, I wanted to go back to this point about Donald Trump being really a novice when it comes to governing and not really knowing much, not operating from a sense of values. I mean, he knows the business world, so to speak. Um, isn't that, is there something to be learned in that, in that the public is uh, disaffected with the establishment, established politicians, that this guy was going to blow up the political system that the public largely views as dysfunctional, and somehow that this guy is the remedy are there any parallels with Schwarzenegger, who was a celebrity, who was an outsider, but really didn't know much, if anything, about governing or government, but that's somehow viewed as an antidote to our political dysfunction? Is there something in there? Schwarzenegger got some good people around him, um, particularly after he got his head handed to him when he, when he tried the, the three... Uh, a ballot measures, which was a function of one set of consultants, he got rid of those people, and he brought in he brought in some uh, some very savvy people, including Susan Kennedy, who was uh, uh, was she chief of staff or was she? Uh, yeah, I guess she was. Um, and um, he had, he, I think Schwarzenegger, narcissistic as he may be, knew what he didn't know. And I think that's an important distinction for somebody in politics. <clears throat> Trump, I don't think, know, doesn't know what he doesn't know. Um, and he thinks he knows everything. I think Schwarzenegger um, really wasn't, I don't think Schwarzenegger thought he knew everything. And he was willing to seek advice. Right. Um, and after, you know, the, the last part of the Schwarzenegger governorship wasn't that different than having a moderate Democrat. Right in there. He wasn't that, but he and Gray Davis are pretty good friends at this point. Uh, they're not that far apart politically. If you take Schwarzenegger as, as he really is and not as he tried to be for a little while. You know, it's, I mean, it's an interesting question because if you look at California, Schwarzenegger is the first and only 
sort of business person who tried to get into policy. Every other one has been rejected going, you know, Bill Simon, Al Checky, um, uh, Meg Whitman, um, who was it? Michael Huffington. My, yeah, Huffington, all, well, Huffington ran for Senate, but yeah. So it, it was something of a, of a novelty for, San, uh, for uh, California to do that. But I think on general in, in California, people kind of, kind of recognize that. That said, I do think there, there is a large um, uh, cohort of, of the electorate that, that do want to blow government up, that do feel uh, that it's not doing anything for them, that it is. And Hillary is, you know, she was the very uh, definition of elitist. I mean, that's, that, that's the world that she moved in, and, and that's where she spent her time for the last 25 years, and so, uh, so there was. And I think the thing that we can't forget, and I think the thing that the mainstream media f forgets, is the racism and the misogyny and the xenophobia that Trump campaigned on. And no, Trump voters are not necessarily racist and misogynistic and xenophobic, but they endorsed those views, and, and they, they brought that across. Well, and if you in, look at... In, in fairness, though, weren't they endorsing a view? I mean, you, you, I'm sure you've seen the same studies that show a fair number of people who voted for Obama voted for Trump. And, and it was the same thing. We need somebody who's going to change how government operates. People are frustrated the government isn't getting... Of course, excluding all the governments in San Mateo County, where which are models of how to get things done. But they're, they're frustrated at the federal level that things don't get done, that there's gridlock, that they don't find ways to do consensus, find consensus. Um, I mean, there's a legitimate element to that. No, I'm not, I don't think it's an either or proposition. But I'm saying that I think since the election, that if you read and follow the mainstream media, and I think the Times, the New York Times and the Post have done fabulous work on, on Trump and, and his background, a little late, but still they've done it, that the, the narrative now is, oh, we missed the story about all of the, all of the working class white people who've been left behind. And yes, there, there should have been more coverage of that. But at the same time, that's supplanted this other story, which was very real. Uh, you know, I grew up in blue collar Ohio and, and east of Cleveland. And I went back for my 50th high school reunion last summer. And I can tell you, there was a lots of N words and lots of C words that were going around. And that was a big issue. If you look at who voted for Trump, uh, white men, 63 to 31. Uh, white men without a college graduate, uh, graduate degree, 72 to 23. Um, white women, 53 to 43. White women without a college graduate degree, 62, 34. So the only subgroup there is white women with a, who have our college graduates voted for Hillary, 51 to 45. Um, so, you know, that's not new necessarily between Republicans and, and Democrats, but I think it is certainly more pronounced that we've seen. And everybody knew what they were getting with this guy. I mean, there was no way to not know that. He wasn't. It wasn't dog whistles, which is what everybody said. I mean, he was just putting it out there. Yeah. Now, Phil, is, is there, you know, there's another theory, which is there's social changes taking place that are not going to be undone. When you've had the first African-American president, when you've had uh, the first Latina on the Supreme Court, when things like same-sex marriage, public opinion on that turns around so dramatically and so quickly, is, is this a new status quo, or is this the end of a status quo in which, you know, for, for most of our lifetime, white males have been the dominant force in the electorate. Is that a change? Yeah. <laughs> Not to mention at this panel, yes. <laughs> so I think, it, I think, I think we're seeing Did you just lot. notice that now, <laughs> really? I'm a trained observer. <laughs> I think, I think My skills have atrophied while I've gone to work for government. There's a certain last gasp quality of, 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 about um, what we're seeing here. Uh, unfortunately, we're living through that last gasp. Um, <laughs> or not. Yeah, or not. Um, I think it's important to remember when we try to get at 30,000 feet and look down what's going on, to actually get down and sit in the stands with the fellow parents who were at the Little League game and remember that what people are really paying attention to is whether their garbage gets picked up and whether there's potholes in the street and whether or not um, uh, the, 
basic local services are working as the electricity functioning. People at local level really want to know. And can, can I teach my kid to throw better than Kevin? Yeah, exactly. P people are too Thanks. busy uh, to pay much attention to grand ideas. They don't want to be in a war. They don't want to be threatened. Um, and so they'll tell pollsters, Donald Trump is completely incompetent. They'll tell the pollsters he's not qualified. I mean, Jerry's got some data here. That nobody thought he was qualified to be president of the United States, including people who voted for him. How do you explain that? How do you explain? They didn't think he was qualified. They didn't think he had the temperament. And yet he wins. Now, what does that mean? It means that none of that stuff matters that much to people. It's much more, it's much more visceral uh, than what was going on with, with a lot of voters, I think. Can I uh, circle back to just how the media is treating um, this Trump presidency? I, th I think the media generally is doing a pretty good job exploring the Russia connection and so forth. There's some revisionist stuff happening here. But in terms of how they deal with blatant, um, blatant lies or misinformation where three to four million people voted illegally, there's absolutely no evidence, none, to suggest that four, three to four million people voted illegally. But the president of the United States, the spokesperson for the country, the leader of the free world, is putting out something that's blatantly false. So how is the media grappling with this? Because there's a, you know, the media itself doesn't poll very well. This is a really so the question, question is, who is acting as a check on the system? I, I think that's one of the scariest things about the whole situation, because um, for a lot of cultural reasons and talk radio and other things, the media, which is to say the mainstream media, is no longer the media. You know, we've got social media, which is going to outstrip all other media pretty soon. We've got fake media. Um, so there's, you know, when you say the media, it's a broad range of things. But to address the mainstream media uh, specifically, has been discounted as a neutral referee. There is no neutral referee. We used to play that, or I say we, not Calbaz particularly, but um, used to play that role. So politician X would say, you know, this, this is such and so, and the paper would say, no, it's not. They would have a fact check, and people would go, oh, it's not. And so what's happening now is what some people have called gaslighting, which is Trump says, this picture shows I have five million more people at my uh, inauguration. And, and the Washington Post and the New York Times say, no, it doesn't. And Trump says, see, that proves that it's true because they said it's not true. And so it's, it's not so much to, <clears throat> excuse me, argue about, you know, my interpretation of the facts is stronger than your interpretation. It's about the nature of reality itself. Um, and what happens, and, and there's been a lot written about this in dictatorships and in authoritarian governments, is that it just kind of wears people down. And so I think that was the significance of Trump saying, oh, Obama wiretapped me during, in, in, my, in my tower. I was like, whoa, whoa, did you hear that? So that, you know, again, you know, people want to know whether their garbage is going to pick up their kid's school. They haven't got time to figure out, you know, follow this stuff like, like you know, people in Washington do. Well, there's a counter narrative. Well, maybe that's more true than, than what these media are saying, which I don't like anyway, because they believe in climate change. So. Uh, the, there's no objective truth to be gained. So yes, that's a huge, huge point. It, it, it's hard to it's hard to overstate the importance of the creation of Fox News, and in conjunction with the disintegration, the atomization of news sources, in such a way that now there are many, <clears throat> as many right wing news sources as there are left wing news sources. Um, the whole concept of balance. See, journalists were sort of, we sort of were trained back in the olden days when Jerry and I were young cub reporters. We Phil were actually trained. covered uh, FDR's first administration. <laughs> <You know? laughs> we, we were trained. We were trained in this notion, and Mark was as well, that you seek um, a set of a balance to try to present a fair picture of what's happening. That is, you look at both sides of an issue and you try to present a balance. 
We didn't really deal with truth. We dealt with facts. And the idea was to try to lay out a set of facts. What's happened is that one side is asserting, one side has begun asserting false information as if it were fact. And no longer can the media afford to just sit around and try to balance um, one side against the other side. The media have been forced into the position, I believe, and I think Jerry would agree, that we, we have to actually set out and say, this is true and that is not true. There's a big debate among journalists about whether you should use the word lie, because lie suggests that, there's a, uh, that, that it's a knowing thing. But you can get around that by simply saying it's a falsehood, it's untrue. Um, you can say all those things and still make the point. The question is, does anybody care? People who are reading Fox, who are watching Fox, don't care. People who, by and large, people voted for Donald Trump. 96% of them, they, look, they, this ABC News poll, you should check it out. They say he's incompetent. They don't think he's got all the values. And 96% of the people who voted for him said they wouldn't change a thing. So people will seek out information that reaffirms their uh, preconceived notions and reject information that's Just ignore not. it. Not Exactly. Let me ask you about Fox, since you're on the subject, because there, there have been recent stories about, it was a Sunday New York Times Magazine piece about the, the incredible influence of Fox and its rise during this whole period. Roger Ailes was the critical uh, architect of Fox's rise. Bill O'Reilly was the lead face of Fox. They're both gone. Does Fox lose its influence as a, as a factor in American politics? It may lose some, but somebody will come along, that stupid stuck, uh, Tucker Carlson. No, I don't. No, not to bring back his He's such bow tie. I don't think so. <laughs> Because they're filling a space, they're filling an ideological space or a market is, is really what they're filling. And so I don't think that those viewers are going to go suddenly say, well, you know, we really need to watch this Rachel Maddow. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you about something else. I was struck. Um, there's been such a change in the tone that, that the guy standing up and yelling, you lie at President Obama, sounds like a, you know, simpler, happier time compared to what happens now. Um, I, I, I was really struck by the photo of Sarah Palin, Kid Rock, and Ted Nugent in the White House standing in front of the portrait of Hillary Clinton. That's the triad, according to uh, Trump. Well, it, it's, it's a holy triad, one might think. But it, in front of a photo of uh, the, the portrait of Hillary Clinton, flipping the bird. And I'm thinking, you know, we never used to, you know, this is one of these old guy things. You know, in my day, there was respect. But it's, um, things are really different in terms of how people are willing to talk about. I mean, it's hard to imagine a political figure condoning that, allowing it to happen. You'll see um, a loss of decorum. Is, is that something that's also temporary as we sort out the social media stuff? Because I suspect that's got a lot to do with it. Or, are we, you know, or did re rock and roll really destroy America? You know, they were all right in the 50s. You know? <laughs> Well, I, I don't know. It's a. You sound like I, I think I will. I sound, sound like an old guy. I know. Yeah. There's no there, but there there's a certain trashy element to what uh, Trump has set loose. Uh, it's not only the misogyny and the racism, um, but it's a kind of willingness to just sort of um, use. Trashy, a, tr a trashy worldview. It's hard to describe any uh, in, in any other way that that's been set loose. And I don't know how you put that back in the box. Yeah, I mean, he's again. It's the norms that he's rejected. That um, I don't. I mean, what's it like in Sacramento? Is that is that true in Sacramento now, or or the Republicans act like that, or there's still. No. A, we so have of, of so few of them. You know, we have a, a, a very civil working relationship with the Republicans in the legislature. Uh, it's, uh, I don't want to say it's night and day with Washington, D.C., but a, a lot of these national debates um, don't really infect how we deal with these things. Um, so we have actually gone out of our way, though, 
Of course, it's easier when you have a super majority and you run everything to be magnanimous and reach out. Um, right. uh, that being said, I, I wouldn't say, I almost said I wouldn't say this publicly. There are a few people here. Um, I think we might even be uh, better off with more balance in the legislature because it would force uh, us to, to cooperate on all sorts of issues as opposed to do things as a super majority. Uh, but there's a, I think, a cultural kind of a difference with California, just the kinds of Republicans that we see versus those you see in Washington, D.C. Um, so we really are something of an island uh, in how we are operating compared to the rest of the country and compared to Washington, D.C. That's just my general feeling. And, and the civility is still there. It is. It is very much so. And we, but we make a conscious effort to reach out to our Republican colleagues. And, and we have, I'm the speaker pro tem, so I run the floor sessions. We are continually working with the Republican leaders on the, just the flow of business. I mean, it, it's, you know, we're on two different teams, but we're all in the same league, so to speak. Um, so I, I just, it doesn't really bear much of a relationship to what it, I see from afar going on in, in Washington. You see, no. well, Mark, people in this room know who Adam Schiff and, and, and uh, Kevin Nunes, Nunes is, right? We know those names. We know who those people are. We, we, we understand that they have a relationship on the intelligence, uh, on the House Intelligence Committee. Um, do you think the average person has any clue who those people are? We were talking about who's going to run for Senate. And well, some people are talking about maybe um, Adam Schiff will run for Senate. And Jerry was pointing out, no, but he, his name ID would be 1%. Maybe. Maybe. I mean, in his, in his little congressional district, he's known. But, um, uh, but the average, average person has no concept who any of these people are. How many people here know who Adam Schiff is? This is a well above average group. Know who what? This is a well above average group. This yeah. must be like Woe Begone. Um, <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the other part of it that so, sort of dismays me is, and you've referred to it a couple of times, Jerry, the, the loss of what have been acceptable norms. Somebody caught in a lie. It used to damage their career. Right. Somebody setting things up so their family could run, continue to run the business while they're serving, you know, saying I'm not going to have my family in the government, and then boom, they've got offices next to the Oval Office. Is that again a new norm? So one of the things that you see frustrating people is um, that the discourse is dominated by the extremes. That you've got Democrats pushing someone like Pelosi or even Feinstein, well, you need to be tougher. You need to be more like them in terms of rhetorically how you respond to them. Uh, you've known Diane Feinstein a long time. It's hard to imagine she would do that. Um, no. <laughs> but um, that's not going to help anybody, is it, to have this discourse just continue to be uh, so polarized? Yeah, I, I just, I don't think we know. I mean, Trump is so sui generis. I mean, it's just he's one of a kind. and no matter what it seems like, we've only been at this for 100 days, so. <laughs> <laughs> He's got three years and nine months more to go in the, in the first term, so, you know. So, so I, what is this? You know, it's, it, it, it's hard to, yeah. The level of corruption, the level of um, just indecency is so great and it happens every, things happen every day. I think as Mark is getting to the point was, any one of those things would have been enough to knock somebody out 10 years ago. Now let me ask any, you. That. Any one of those things, but now you can't even keep up with them. You know, there's a word in from the Greek that sort of describes what we have. It's called, it's kakistocracy. Have you seen this word? K-A-K-I, kakistocracy. It means government by the worst elements of society. It's an actual, that they, because they experienced it at one point in Greece. Jeez, you're, going, Greece. you're going dark this the morning. Kakistocracy. <laughs> well, I just, I like the I'm fact I'm glad that, we had this talk. I mean, I think everybody's <laughs> feeling. It's cathartic, yeah. Well, plus, plus Phil is, you know, how many panels have we had here where somebody has used a Greek word? Um, <laughs> hey, what about sui generis? Okay, well, we got a little good, yeah. All right, okay. <laughs> Jerry can explain the, 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 the Greek roots of politics. No, yeah. that's a yes. 
Let's, they, let's they, not uh, do that. No? no we do that. <laughs> not today. We'll save that for next year. No, it's a, they're, they're, um, but, but going back to what you said, Phil, is very sweeping. The, the level of corruption, it's, a, it's also depressing. But it, how, do you, how do you not get dismissed to somebody who's basically just taking a partisan point of view? That, well, yeah, but you're from the media, you're, you're, part, you're a liberal. Some would argue you're not even, you're too far to left to be liberal. I guess progressive is the word now anyway. Well, that's the problem. And, and it goes back to the issue of there, no be, there being no facts, because everybody has their own set of facts. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. You know, obviously the, the Internet is, is, you know, pri the, the, the primary one and the decline of mainstream media. So there's no arbiter. So if everybody has their own set of facts and everyone only has to read things with which they agree on their Facebook feed, um, then, then it's impossible to kind of not be. Because if you disagree with me, then you must be part of the, those other guys who are always lying. And, and it goes both ways. I was going to say, you all lived through Watergate. I was just a little toddler. <laughs> um, are there... Learning how to throw a baseball. <laughs> Are there parallels to Watergate? I guess what I'm coming back to is you talk about, hey, we're hitting the 100-day mark, but it feels like a year or two. The pace of what's happening here, the churn, the disruption. How sustainable is a Trump administration? I mean, this is really unlike anything we've seen. Um, but the Russia connection, the charges of treason and so forth. I mean, you guys have been in the game for quite a while. Is your antenna up and are you seeing that this is not going to be a four-year administration that we are on? We're careening down a path of that's that's um, I, you know heading toward. I, I think it's a direct function of <clears throat> the extent to which Trump becomes a danger to the re-election of Republican office holders. I mean, that's I, the key. I, I think that's the point at which. But for, until then, he'll sign their stuff. He'll go along with them. He'll appoint all these judges. And for, from their perspective, there's no checks and balances. What, is, what is not to like? So I think you know, the areas of resistance are basically three Republicans in the Senate, um, uh, McCain and, and Graham and uh, Susan Collins, who you know, could, could switch the balance of powder, power there. Um, you know, looking ahead to the midterms and, and the Democrats, you know, trying to be as obstructionist as possible until then. And, you know, there's an outside possibility they could flip the House. Um, and then the popular resistance movements, what, whatever they are. I mean, I don't think, I mean, Phil was a, a, just a really criminal uh, leader of the SDS in those days. I had nothing to do with it myself. But I don't think we've seen mass marches and mass movements like we've seen since Trump has been in since the 60s and, and the 70s. So I think those are really the three elements. And then, you know, just the media for whatever it's worth or journalism for whatever it's worth and trying to just continue to to, to right. put and out. There, there are so many people who've never been involved in politics who have been poked to, to act and to take to the streets. I mean, this is, there's a social movement happening in opposition, which wouldn't really affect necessarily the Republicans that control. But to your point about when the lines cross, when Trump becomes a drag on the electoral fortunes of the Republicans in 2018 and reelect in 2020, because 2020 is when 2020 will be so crucial because it's when uh, redistricting will be in play. And redistricting is at the core of how the Republicans control Congress. So who controls the state legislatures and the governorships controls who uh, is the majority in Congress, the way the districts are drawn. So uh, there's a lot of sort of dynamics, both at the state level and the national level. But when he becomes a drag, you're going to see a different uh, approach, I think, that Republicans will take toward Trump. You know, I think one thing that's, that gets overlooked, Mark, is, is how bad a job the Democratic National Committee has done compared to the Republican National Committee at helping local party members at building the party in places where they can control their legislatures and thereby control districting. 
this doesn't get covered on the talk shows because it's kind of boring stuff that is re redistricting led and, and yet it's the essence of how the Republicans are able to control the House of Representatives with fewer votes total cast for, for Republican candidates and for Democratic candidates if you add up the totals. It's because they they control enough legislatures and governorships to control how the maps are drawn. And that's a crucial factor. The Democratic National Committee has, ne has done a crappy job at building the party in, at that level. You know, I think that's another issue that actually contributes to the civility and relative high-mindedness of Sacramento is that we no longer do that. We, that's not the way that we draw our political districts. We have this independent commission, which that's Schwarzenegger right. brought in. And he's now leading a national campaign to bring that to a, to a number of other states. And that's, you know, again, it's real boring, but that's a reform that would be huge if, if states pick their districts by, um, uh, you know, uh, rationality rather than, rather than politics. Let's go back then to some of the statistics that Phil cited at the very beginning about 76% of the vote in San Mateo County was for Hillary Clinton. Because Silicon Valley really turned blue with Clinton. In a lot of ways, I think because he was a lot like a lot of those people in terms of how, how nimble his mind was and how interested he was in a wide range of intellectual pursuits. Um, but I've always wondered if, if it's really that blue. In San Mateo County used to be uh, Republican, used to have Republican office holders. Um, Jerry Hill will kill me if I say this, but he used to be a Republican. He's yeah, but they were Becky Morgan's. They, Becky Morgan wouldn't even be considered Tom a Republican. Tom Campbell, anymore. Ed Shaw. Yeah, I mean, Ed Shaw and but, Tom Campbell. These, these people, Tom, Pete McCloskey, these people wouldn't be considered Republicans in the modern era. But that's the point, I guess, is, is there, there's an undercurrent of people who would prefer to be Republicans if there was any logical reason why they should be one in the context of San Mateo County or Silicon Valley. So, so the question is, is there a, an opportunity there when you start doing things like redistricting, and, and also with our, the way our primary votes are now, it tilts more toward moderates, which also probably has something to do. You've got people now in the legislature who have to appeal across party lines to be successful. Is there, a, is there a, a, you know, an ability for that to be restored, or is, is the, the blue going to stay, and that's the way it's going to be, just because of the way the parties? You mean in California, or you mean national? In California, and in this area in particular. Well, I think it's been restored to some extent in California, as Jerry pointed out, by, you know, Ro Khanna got elected, right, in, uh, uh, over my condo. Ro Khanna had to appeal to sort of the middle um, uh, of the electorate, and Honda had the labor left locked up, but she knocked off a congressman. That's very unusual to knock off the U.S. congressman. It doesn't happen very often. Um, but well, California is not the rest of the country. The last moderate Republican national figure was Pete Wilson, with Governor Pete Wilson, when he was the governor and made a brief, was pro choice, uh, ill, ill fated bid to be president. But he was pro choice and he was pro environment. And he was very conservative about fiscal issues and economic issues. And he was moderate to liberal on cultural issues. And that's was the Republican Party of which you speak. But the California Republicans have driven all those people off. I mean, with their, their witch hunts with, with William Dannemeyer and, you know, the burning gays and, 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 you know, they don't want anybody who's pro-choice around. Uh, so that's not going to happen. And then I think the other factor is, uh, you know, Wilson <laughs> burned the bridge with Proposition 187 in, in, in 1994 with the Latino population, which is obviously been growing consistently and will continue to do so. Um, and so I think those two factors militate against you seeing re Republican, Republicans making a comeback here. Um, again, you know, we're different than the rest of the world, so it's, except for the East Coast. No, no pro-life Republican has won at the statewide level in California uh, since George Bush beat Michael Dukakis in 1988. Um, Arnold Schwarzenegger, could never have gotten the nomination of the Republican Party in California because of the recall process 
he managed to get elected president, uh, governor, and thereby was able to maintain. But a pro light, a pro choice, pro environment, pro immigration Republican. Well, path to citizenship, not necessarily. Yeah, you yeah. just say a path to citizen. Somebody who believes in a path to citizen. Pathway to, we've actually laid we actually laid out a program of how to restore the Republican Party in California. We they didn't take us up on they it. Didn't take yeah. us up. You know, but a couple of years ago, we spelled it out. There's no reason why they have to take those positions except to appeal to their right wing base. But that kind of Republican could win in California. That's a popular, you know, a, a moderate person of either party could win governorship in California if you could get the nomination. The problem is... Well, you can get the nomination now because it's top two. Yeah, you might be able to get it. Let me ask you then about the movement for some people think California is just insane. I know, I know the guy who was backing that who's not even from California has uh, shelved it. But is there any, um, you know... <laughs> No. The numbers you no. said. No. The answer is no. <laughs> we're for it. We're for it. It's not going to happen. You're for it? <laughs> sure. Well, here's the thing. I mean, you know, you're, you're familiar with what's been happening with the $647 million we're, we were supposed to get from the federal government, and we missed uh, getting it from the Obama administration by a matter of days. Um, it's the only program in this particular grant program that's gotten all the way through the process and not gotten its funding. You speak of the electrification of... Uh, yes, the electrification. Uh, yeah. It is of what you I just, speak. No, I just want to make sure we're talking about... We're not talking about sanctuary cities or something, because no. that's another... Well, but, but, it, but it gets to the point about how determined are they to punish California and Washington and the Trump administration? Well, you got $647 million that you're hoping for for the upgrades to Caltrans, right? right. Um, which got shelved at the last minute after Obama had approved it. $647 million for your, what is it, $2 billion upgrade? Right. Okay. And it's got to run through counties that voted 76, 73, and 85% for Hillary Clinton. Politics? <laughs> you, I mean, what's the point? Why, why, if you're Donald Trump in his administration, those people, why, why reward those people? Yeah, well, I, it would it, create jobs in Utah and some other states. Uh, that are red that did vote for him, but I don't know that that's necessarily translating. You know, I think when you, you know, think about Donald Trump punishing someone because they disagree, I don't see it. I just, I don't, I don't think <laughs> Not gonna happen. No, I think, you know, I mean, there's a whole bunch of issues. I mean, there are, are uh, fuel efficiency standards. I mean, the, this guy Pruitt at the EPA who says carbon isn't part of climate, uh, causing climate change, you know, he wants to, not allow California to, to, to do that. And I know Jerry goes crazy about the climate change stuff. And, um, you know, just this morning, there's a piece in the Times about the Justice Department notifying eight cities that, you know, they're not going to receive um, law enforcement money because of, you know, their sanctuary cities. Interestingly, they picked Sacramento and, and, <laughs> and, and not San Francisco. And I, I couldn't figure out what that was about. Well, but you, if you're a Republican, you pick on San Francisco, that's like red meat. It's like, it doesn't hurt you at all, right? So, so yes, I, I think he will. And I think that the, the, the state, and Kevin, you, you could certainly speak to this more knowledgeably than us, is you know, going to have to really have what looks like a, a, a litigation um, a strategy at this point. And this guy, Javier Becerra, the attorney general, we've, we've been so impressed with him. We've interviewed him a couple times, and he's really a first-rate guy. So I don't know, what is the state going to do? Well, there's a little bit of a dance going on. Um, I think Javier Becerra is kind of channeling the energy in the legislature to stand up to the Trump administration to fight Trump. I think the governor um, is trying to be uh, strategic um, he is very vocal on climate change and, and has been vocal against Trump, but behind the scenes, I think he realizes that he's, he has to be a bridge of sorts to Washington, D.C., and not really go out of his way to poke Trump in the eye. So he's been a little more muted. Of course, he's been in the game a long time and is looking out for the broader interest of the state. That being said, um, we've hired Eric Holder uh, for legal strategy. That, that what we're struggling with is um, picking the fights that we can win and being very strategic about 
where California draws the line and fights or where we try to cooperate. And there's, what about there's sanctuary a state? Million. Can you win that fight? The sanctuary, What's that? The sanctuary state? Making California a sanctuary state? I'm sorry. We have Interview. had discussions about this issue in caucus, and um, I'm not ready to comment on it just yet. Well, I, I'd say, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, wait, I, I thought, thought he was, was the co-host, host, host, man. Why, why am I answering wait, questions? Wait, I, got no, I got no problem with wait, the concept. You know, that. Roberts, we ask the questions around here. <laughs> yeah, I, got, I, got, I, got, I got no problem with the concept of that, but you, don't, you think, don't you think it's like a wave and a, a red flag in front of a bull? Maybe. <laughs> Changing the subject briefly. Uh, you guys have known Jerry Brown. What for a Mr. Long. Mullen meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> and you think Chris Matthews asked him? Yeah, that's right. Yes. Jerry, you've known Jerry Brown a long time. When you when you report on him in your. On your website, you run a picture of him dressed as Gandalf. No, not dressed as. We've, we've actually morphed him into yeah. Gandalf. Well, you, you photoshopped his face into yeah. Gandalf. Governor yeah. Gandalf. Governor yes. Gandalf, yeah. What's your take on him? Because he's, he's been several different Jerry Browns over the years. Several, he's, yeah. He's several, sort of like the grumpy old miser. I think now. He's, he's become one of the, maybe the second best governor in history of California after his father. And I think that's his only thing he'd like to be better than his dad or at least accomplish what his dad did, and I think partly that's what the rail would, uh, would be, his, uh, be his legacy in that regard. Uh, but uh, I think he's turned out to be an enormously effective governor. When he was, uh, we had just started Cowboys in 2009. We got the first interview with him uh, before he announced he was running about running for governor. Um, for some reason, I don't know. Well, he doesn't talk to us anymore. But, um, <laughs> uh, and he was very uh, thoughtful in a way. You know, we're sort of acknowledging all the things that he had done wrong the first time. He, you know, I was in a hurry. I wanted to be president. I wanted to do this. I wanted to do that. And we said, well, what are you going to do differently? He said, well, I'm going to be an apostle of common sense. And we're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> an apostle of common sense. That was our head, apostle of common sense. But he's turned out to, to be that. Exactly. He really has. Yeah. And the thing is that because he's held every office uh, in California, no to man. <laughs> he, he, he has a mastery of this stuff, which is, as Trump is finding out, is not easy. Legislation and, and making, it's not easy. It's complicated stuff. But he has a mastery of it at every level, and so that's why I think he's been able to be a very successful governor. Plus, you got to hand it to him. I mean, he went out and asked for a tax increase with Proposition 30 in 20, 2012. He said that's what he would do. He wouldn't raise taxes unless people agreed. He went out, he campaigned for it, and they did. And that was a huge thing that got us out of that hole that we had, had been in. And then obviously he, the economic recovery helped him a lot too. But I, I think he's been first rate. My question is, how is he gonna be able to walk away from this? I mean, well, he keeps saying he's gonna go up to the ranch. He has, he has 25 million bucks in his campaign fund that's gonna be spent on something, so. Well, he couldn't use that in a federal race because you can't take that unlimited state money and move it over to a federal race. But if Feinstein were to retire, we were talking the other night, last night, I mean, he really is the best, single best candidate available to run for U.S. Senate. Oh, sure, he's 104 years old. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's what let's get it? into that for no, a second. No, 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 there's a difference. I mean, Feinstein is older than the Golden Gate Bridge. <laughs> but, but, but Jerry is older than the ballpoint pen. This was so, uh, <laughs> These are actual facts. These are actual facts, not alternative, alternative facts. Not alternative. Well, so, so let's, let's take some of this. I want to get into Feinstein in a minute. But also, what does it say about our bench <laughs> that our two most viable people are in their 80s and 70s? It's like... Well, the bench compared. If you took our bench and compared it to any other Who's state, our? Who's ours? Who's ours? Speak for yourself. If you took California's bench of of candidates and compared it to any other state, it would look really good. But compared to it's California, you got to be something special. No, but I I think are you referencing nationally the Democratic bench? Oh, well, I mean, national. there's a whole generation of people plugged up behind Feinstein. Who can't even get started because it's an interesting choice of words. Well, <laughs> <laughs> only to you. Kind of, kind of Freudian. 
a Sunday morning. Well, Mark. we can't get into some of those stories quite yet, but um, well, <laughs> no, we can't. I just started You're thinking right. about all the things I shouldn't say. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of this whole generation that's waiting for Feinstein and Pelosi to get out of the way. It's probably a better way of putting it. And she was in Sillyvale Friday. Um, Jim Hartnett and Seamus Murphy and I were there along with a number of other people in the room. She doesn't look like she's going anywhere. Um, first of all, you think, do you think she'll run? You literally wrote the book on her. But second of all, is it, is it harmful to have her, you know, to have this person who's in office who doesn't give anybody else a chance, not that she's spending a lot of time worrying about other people's chances? Well, I, I, I think whether she runs or not is, is um, completely related to the health of her husband who has, uh, Dick Blum has, uh, being treated for lung cancer. And, you know, I don't know how that's going to play out. And I have no information about that. But I think that's her biggest. And she said that to the LA Times the other day. So I think that's the biggest issue there. Um, and I think you could argue the other question both ways. Because, yeah, it'd be great for her to get out of the way. But, you know, would you prefer to have Dianne Feinstein as the senior senator from California or Kamala Harris? Um, so I think particularly now that it's important for her to be there because she knows how the place works. She has the relationship. She has the institutional knowledge of it. So I think it's a good thing for California to, to that, that she's there right now. Yeah. What about Pelosi? Is, wait, wait, let me back. Do you think the Dems have a chance to take back the House? And if they don't, is, is that it for her? I mean, she's... It's, to me, it's remarkable that she held on to the leadership position when they lost the House after she became Speaker. So I'm, I've always puzzled at why she's able to hold on to it now. What's the downside for California for having Nancy Pelosi as the leader or as the Speaker? I think, or are you asking about the, the Democratic Party? The well, National. I'm asking about the leadership. I'm asking, you know, you know she's it's the not, face of, First of all, it's not, it's not, you're going to get another liberal from San Francisco really elected. Think, uh, so... That's not an issue. So what, if we're looking at it from California's perspective, why, do we, why would you want Nancy Pelosi anywhere else? Well, I think, I, you know, if the question is, is she hurting the Democrats' chances of, of gaining seats or substantial number of seats or taking back the House? Um, yeah, maybe, but I think it goes even more deeply to the gerrymander question that Kevin referenced earlier. I mean, I think that's the real reason for it. And the reason she's there is because she raised a lot of money. She's the world's greatest fundraiser in the history of the world. Funder. She's indefatigable. She travels all over the country to everybody's district and raises money for them. And she's, you know, all of the moderates have been defeated. So the people, <laughs> the people who are left are all kind of liberal and, and uh, uh, I think, loyal to her. But do you think the Democrats take, take back the House in eight, uh, next year? They have to switch 24 seats, if, if my math is if i'm remembering the math correctly and if you're wrong i'm sure phil will point no i think he, he would it. be the last okay. person to know but it, it, it's <laughs> the uh and i think there's 27 or 28 districts in in the in the country or may, maybe a couple more where hillary won a majority but or or won the district but there's a republican uh, member and i think there's seven of those in california four are in orange county three are in the valley so yeah, I think it's mathematically possible, especially if those seven seats got flipped. And I think if there are Democrats who are looking for something to do to make a, a difference, it would be to you know somehow get involved in those seven seven campaigns right. in, in the next two years. So part of the problem for Democrats in California is they can't find a place to go be effective because they live in so many of them live in districts where they're already got a, a, a Democrat, but they may live next door to a district that's got a marginal Republican, like Jeff Denham, for example. Uh, Daryl Issa. Daryl yeah. Issa. Jeff Knight. Yeah. I mean, there's so I want to ask you guys about Steve. 2020 and the early odds on, speaking of a bench, who steps up? Who's the standard bearer for the Democratic Party? Does, <coughs> does Joe Biden, uh, speaking of being advanced <laughs> age, um, is he the standard bearer for the Democratic Party? Uh, do you see a Kamala Harris, uh, Cory Booker? Um, do you go establishment figure or do you go young, somebody who can energize a diverse base of voters in the Democratic Party? 
Well, I think the first thing is that the Democrats are still fighting about what they're what the party is. Um, you know, there's been this. Uh, I don't know. In in Omaha, the Omaha mayor's race. Now we're really getting into junky territory here, <laughs> but there's this huge fight going on because Bernie Sanders went to Omaha to uh, you know endorse and and support this this Democrat, a 37 year old guy who's running for. Uh, mayor, and it turns out he's pro-life, and so uh, a lot of the women's organizations and so on that have been leading the resistance are furious at Bernie. So they're kind of still fighting about what the Democratic Party Bernie is. Sanders, so I think Bernie it, Sanders, who's not actually a, a Democrat. Democrat, yeah. So it, I think it, enti- it it depends a lot on on where they end up, and it seems like they're going in a more progressive um, direction. And we don't have any information about this, but you know, Elizabeth Warren would certainly be somebody that people are very interested in. Uh, you know, Kamala Harris looks in the mirror every day and sees the president, I guess. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't see it. Uh, Cory Booker is, a, is another guy. But, but you don't see one person who says, you know, you say. Wide open. And I think. You but know, who saw Bill Clinton in 1991? Well, let's just say it could be somebody we're not even talking about right now. Did it could be you, Kevin. Yes. It won't be me. Yes. What are you saying? <laughs> But only if you tell us about your sanctuary state <laughs> position. <laughs> Gavin, Gavin Newsom certainly thinks it's him. <laughs> Another well, guy that yeah, looks in the mirror a lot. He takes a poll of one, yes. Um, what about on the Republican side? Could you see anybody taking on Trump in 2020? Again, it depends if he's in, indicted or in jail or under, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I mean, all those guys they ran, yeah. Rubio wants to run again. Cruz wants to, to, to run again. Uh, Kasich, Kasich tr- will probably will run again. It is true that being in jail does hamper your campaign, but it's but it's not a deal breaker. It never hurt Lyndon LaRouche. I remember you. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't hit, hurt uh, James Curley in uh, Boston either. But All right. now we're really going back. Um, what about in 2018? We see obviously Gavin Newsom is off and running. Antonio Villarogosa. Uh, who else do you think is running? You know, running first for governor and for the statewide offices, who do you who do you see emerging from the pack? Well, we've interviewed uh, uh, all all the Democratic candidates except for um, Gavin so far. We interviewed Delane Easton. We've interviewed Antonio. We interviewed John Chong, and uh, Tom Steyer. And we interviewed Tom Steyer, who's who is not a candidate per se, but looks like he could be and is pretty attractive because he's the first self-funding guy, the first rich guy to come along who isn't just an outsider. He's actually paid some dues. He's worked hard inside the party independently, spent a lot of his money doing stuff. He's not just Meg Whitman coming in off the bench and saying, I think I should be governor. Um, he's not uh, Al Checky. Um, he's a different kind of character. And we, we were pretty impressed in our conversation with him. We t- our interviews tend to be more conversations, and, um, and he's, he's able to go one, two, three levels deep, and he's a, sm- he's a smart guy, and he's got the money. Um, we have an interview with this fellow Cox on the other side. Do you know him? Um, the guy who's uh, John Republican. Cox. He's a Republican. He's a Republican. You may have uh, oh. But the, the chances of a Republican becoming governor of California are pretty small. So. But the chances of, of them finishing second are not it's that possible, small. It's possible, right. And being in the runoff. Yeah. In the runoff, yeah. Yeah. And then Gavin, you know, obviously is the, uh, the conventional wisdom front runner. And first rule of politics, the conventional wisdom is always wrong. Right. And, so usually uh, neither, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and, but unless, unless he implodes in some way or somebody else comes along who catches fire. Gavin looks to be the odds on favorite at the moment, but um, if Steyer were to run, I think that would change, uh, would change the dynamic. And the thing, you know, until Diane makes a decision, which will probably be, you know, the day before registration, the way that she thinks about these things, you know, everything's going to be, I mean, I, we could see Tony, uh, Antonio switching over to run for the Senate or Steyer running for the Senate. So it's, it's just, it's kind of, and, unclear until that's clear. But you can count on Diane, as Jerry said, to be late. I mean, Leon Panetta likely would have been governor of California if Diane 
<clears throat> hadn't waited so long to make her announcement that she was not going to run for governor back in, what year was that, 1990? Uh, uh, it was 32. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> but it was when Leon was considering running, um, and um, uh, he had to wait for Diane to announce what she was going to do. We have this picture of Isadora Duncan performing as Salome that we run whenever we do a story about Diane and whether she's <laughs> going to run or not. She's doing the dance of the seven veils about uh, her decision. What about Jerry? Do uh, you think he'd run for Senate if she doesn't? You know, I, 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 I we, wouldn't rule anything I wouldn't out. Rule it out. And, and, and as Jerry pointed out at dinner last night, Ann would kill him. His but, wife. He might be willing to risk it. Um, <laughs> What's the marriage among political friends? You know, he's got this ranch up in Calusa County, and he keeps saying he's going to go up there. And then, they, where he says he killed a yeah, snake. Yeah, and they got this picture of him. He's holding this big rattlesnake, saying, "Oh, I killed this. Get out of here." He didn't. He didn't just kill it. Anyway, uh, I digress. We spent a lot of Talbot's energy chasing after Jay, whether, we got the, yeah, whether we'll, he really killed the snake or we'll, not. We'll tell you all about that later. But, uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I mean, it's just he, the guy's lost one race in his life. It was to Pete Wilson in 1982 for the U.S. Senate. You know, he, it would be sweet for him to be able to redeem it, but maybe he will go up to the ranch. I don't know. It, it's kind of hard. He would be a very wonderful be senator because senators don't have to do anything. They, <laughs> they have a very small <laughs> staff to manage. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a great job being a United States senator. You just talk. You just, it's not like work. I mean, the governor is a hard job. Being governor, it's a better job, but it's a hard job. Senate, a piece of cake. It's like being in the assembly of the Senate or something. Right? Thanks. Well, you grapple with the big issues. There. <laughs> like Sanctuary State would be one, for example. A lot of time thinking, thinking through this. A lot of time thinking. Um, when you were talking about Jerry Brown, I meant to ask you, Kevin, if you've had any experience with him. Um, what was your take on what he's like, what he's like as a man? Uh, Jerry Brown is a master of California politics, um, both the policy side and the political side. Forty million people. It's a tough state to govern. For a while, people thought California was ungovernable. He's proved otherwise. So all in all, he's done a good job. Uh, I would say uh, the best thing he did was get the the taxes passed that has buoyed the budget over the course of his uh, eight, seven years. Um, but there are underlying problems that I wish he had delved into because of the political capital he has, like pensions, like tax reform. There are some underlying fundamental problems with how we, how we do taxes in California. And I think he looked at it and said, it's politically too difficult. I'll just leave it to the next governor. Um, I need to be careful since he's going to sign or veto my bills. All in all, he's been great. <laughs> but he could have done more with the political capital he has and the popularity he, he has and the mastery of the details of policy. Jerry Brown knows you ought to have a split role for Prop 13, but why waste the capital? Well. He'd have to, if he doesn't run for something else. Because it's the right thing to do. Yeah, well, exactly. and besides, what's the point of having it if you're not going to use your political right. capital? Well, no, if he doesn't run for something else, um, and then because he can't use that state money federally, there's a chance this could happen anyway. There's a chance that he could go after that issue with his money. Hasn't well, he... we've managed to uh, move off of Phil's dystopian view of the next few years. <laughs> Thanks to God. <laughs> uh, but we can, so we can take some questions. Uh, some people are out there with microphones, Carolina and some other folks. Who wants to uh, give Phil a piece of their mind? <laughs> uh, we've got people moving around with microphones. I don't know if I will take, so I'm just to... <laughs> I have to walk. Let's start back here. And then we'll, we'll go to Thank you. Um, a while back, I read a, a, a piece where um, the, the author was positing that through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the folks that voted for Trump were um, accepting of broadening civil liberties, tolerance, gay rights, you know, that sort of thing. And then as the economy started impacting them in the 90s and into the aughts is when they started... Um, 
resisting these expansions of civil liberties, and that's kind of why we're seeing the, the bathroom problem now. And that these folks, you know, came out in this last election and made their voices known in a different way. Could you kind of talk about this, this thing about the expanding democratic principles that we were seeing versus this wall that we're, we're running up against now? Um, sure. I just want to find some actual Jerry's fact got some, Jerry's got some actual data here, but let me, offer, it again. let me offer a sort of a philosophical thought, and that is this. I think a lot of those people, whether they were accepting or not, <clears throat> I think that we spent 30 or 40 years tamping down the misogyny and the racism that was still quite prevalent throughout large sections of society. And like Donald Trump was like, op he basically like opened Pandora's box. And once those wild, crazy, nasty, disgusting, mean-spirited spirits were set loose, I don't know how you get them back in the box. That's, maybe it sounds dystopian to you, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, that's what I think. So I think c culturally, that's functionally what happened. Now, whether you can actually tamp that all down again, I don't know. But I don't think that racism that was there and that misogyny that was there ever went away. I just think it had been sort of made socially unacceptable for a long time, and Trump made it acceptable. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, from a social science perspective, I guess, if you have a problem, you know, that you say, well, racism is a problem, there's two ways. You, people have attitudes and they have behavior. So if people don't change attitudes, then laws <coughs> change behavior and they change the attitudes. And I'm not sure where we were on that spectrum. But I think, I do think the people who voted for Trump, there, there was a large social piece of it, cultural piece of it, but I do think there was also a large economic piece. People who wanted dramatic change voted for Trump 83 to 14. People who thought the country was off track economically voted for Trump 69 to 25. People who said they were angry at government voted for Trump 77 to 18. So there's a whole nexus of things there, you know, and, and some of them may be racial and misogynistic, and some of them are, are also definitely economic. Um, uh, evangelicals voted for Trump 81 to 18 percent. How do you explain that? You know, the thrice divorced, uh, uh, grabbing guy, you know, I mean, that, 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 that's, that's crazy. Um, so I, you know, I, I, there was one more thing I just wanted to talk about, some of these attitudes of Trump people, because it's an interesting question about you know which came first you know, there's nothing you know you can get that you can get that on your mobile phone stop it take another question let's take another question by the way Good one of my favorite things about the myth of pandora's box is the thing that was left in the box was hope everything else escaped Ooh. you like that that's Ooh. deep yeah oh, it's <laughs> You know, it's a reference to Phil's use of the Greek word. I found it. Can yeah. I just say this real quick? Yes, yeah, please. Here are works. some things that Trump voters believe. 75% of Trump voters believe climate change is not real or are not sure. 67% believe unemployment grew under Obama. 65% believe Obama is a Muslim. 68% believe Saddam Hussein had MWDs. 47% said after the election that California's vote shouldn't count. <laughs> well, it really didn't, did it? <laughs> and 20% disagreed with the Emancipation Proclamation. That's a, this is a true fact, okay. But 81% when asked, was, is life better or worse for you, uh, for people like you than it was 30 years ago? 81% of Trump voters said it was worse. Only 19% said Clinton. So there's definitely two Americas. I mean, I think that's the takeaway from, from everything that you can say about Donald Trump and on a whole range of issues from economic to, to social and cultural. And that's where we is are. Is this on? Is this on? Okay. Uh, this is just, there's rumor that Carly Fiorina may run for Senate uh, against Tim Kaine. And I'm wondering if you have any perspective on that. It would be her third run. Uh, she's lost pretty badly. And 
the other two? And just wondering if you have any thoughts about that. When did she move there? To Virginia? She's been there, she, she been there a while, while. yeah. She's, you know, Carla Fiorina is a, is a remarkably unlikable person. <laughs> As, a, as, as a, opposed to us. As a, as, a pub, as a public figure, as a public figure. I know people who work for her up close and they say they, she's a really a fine, lovely lady. But as a public figure, she, she's a very unlikable person. And Tim Kaine is an extremely likable guy. So I don't know, there, people vote by party. And Virginia uh, is, you know, has begun to move blue. I think Kaine would probably cleaner clock. But I think it's a much better uh, place for her to run than, than in California. Yeah. I think she would have a much better chance. Yeah. She can retread that sheep commercial. That was, that was, a, so good, effective. That was a good commercial. Joe Goth. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, gentlemen. I want to ask for your comments on the relationship in the last uh, election between law enforcement and Democrats. Uh, it seemed like Trump drew a, uh, drove a wedge between Hillary and law enforcement. Some of the people we've mentioned, the backbench of California, Kamala Harris, uh, Eric Swalwell, Jimmy Panetta was just elected here. Uh, all three of those are former prosecutors from Alameda County. So I'm wondering, can we win back law enforcement as Democrats? I think it's a different, it's a separate issue in California that, again than it is nationally. And I think nationally, what happened w was greatly influenced by the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, situation and the. Again, the FBI director, you know, Comey talking about the Ferguson effect, um, that since there had been so much uh, effort by the uh, Department of Justice and others paid to police departments and the kinds of policing that were going on, uh, that that was that became a very polarizing issue. Um, so, uh, you know, certainly Trump is going to do all that he can to continue to try to make law enforcement look like a partisan issue. And I think. Um, uh, you know, if you look at immigration, for example, and hear law enforcement in California say, you know, it actually makes it better for us from a law enforcement perspective to have uh, immigrants able to, to talk to us and to trust us than it is to be fearful of a deportation force. Um, you know, that's the kind of issue that's that's just going to mix things up terribly, because I think we in California have a, a much different perspective on that than than people do elsewhere. And certainly than the attorney general of the United States. does. I've always thought one of the masterful things that Bill Clinton did was turn gun control into a pro law enforcement, you know, get tough on law on crime position. It's an example a, of how masterful it was. But B, it shows you how these issues can really, if, if you've got the, if they're in the hands of the right person, can really cut both ways. If you do. Uh, can I just say very briefly, and I want to actually hear from Phil on this, because Gray Davis, despite him being eventually recalled, a part of the key, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, Phil, part of his success in the Democratic Party and in becoming the governor was a strong relationship with public safety, public safety unions. He was kind of a law and order Democrat uh, which may be a little uh, out of step with where sort of the, the progressive nature of the party is going, but there is a roadmap there, and people have been successful uh, in California. Yeah, well, in that nobody was ever going to get to the right of Gray on public safety issues. That was his sort of shtick, um, and because he felt like he had to be there in order to, uh, to not get wiped out. In part because, this is why, and partly why this is such a tricky issue for Democrats, is that at root, law enforcement support is fundamentally a labor union issue. It's a question of, I mean, at, at both the local level, where, where, where they're fighting for binding arbitration, or they're fighting for contract issues, all the way up to the statewide level. It, and then it becomes, but, but it has a patina of uh, public safety uh, around it that makes it very that, that makes it extremely important for Democrats to maintain this position. You know where this gets really interesting is the same way that Clinton did with gun control. Democrats have an actual opportunity here on the ACA, and the reason is and I know this is true in Santa Cruz County because I've done some reporting on it, but I think it's true in many other places and around the country. Law enforcement has come to rely on the ACA to fund drug diversion 
and keep people out of jails that they're picking up for, for, uh, for, for drug crimes and they're using the ACA to fund those beds. If you take away ACA, law enforcement's going to be re-overwhelmed with the problem of having to incarcerate all these people they've been picking up on drug and psychological problems. Now, if a skilled politician at the national level could make use of that um, and turn that into a Democrat, a law enforcement reason to maintain the ACA, you following me? Yeah. In the same way Clinton did with gun control. Next question. Somebody's out here with a microphone somewhere. Good question. Yes. Um, I'm going to go question. back to your Carly Fiorina thing. I'm an ex HP -er, so clearly. She was. She Carly Fiorina. I'm a former employee oh. and hated hated <laughs> what she did to a company that that I cared for. But I the terminology you used. She's extremely unlikable. Hillary's extremely unlikable. G Jerry Brown very articulate. Really knows how to do things. Men. Jim Kane really likable guy. It goes back to who would you rather have a beer with? Um, I never said Hillary's unlikable. No, 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 no. And yet, I'm an MSNBC watcher, and <laughs> even on Rachel and even on Chris Hayes, she's very unlikable. Those messages get repeated over and over again. I'm looking at a panel of all men. Sorry, love you all, but all men. We women have to be very, very good, and yet we're still unlikable. Can you speak on how your industry is going to change the vocabulary so that we're not held to <laughs> I, I, I think Hillary's likable enough. So it was your quote, man. You go for it. So Jerry, tell me why you <laughs> tell me why you hate women. <laughs> I'm not. This is your problem. This I, is not. <laughs> I'm the one who said. I'm the only one. The only woman I spoke to uh, on this in, in that case was Carly Fiorina, who I think is extremely unlikable. I don't think Hillary Clinton was extremely unlikable. I don't think. Elizabeth Warren is particularly unlikable. I, you know, Tim Kaine is a big, sort of a teddy bear kind of guy. Um, but um, well, but I think uh, you make a valid point. Which I'm is, not sure what the point is. Well, I, I, I think in this case, it's 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 not unusual in business and in politics. Women have to be a grade above what men seem to be to get the same level of attention. Is there a question that that Hillary Clinton was treated differently? at least in significant part because she was a woman candidate. I don't think anybody here would disagree with that. And that's why Jerry references the misogyny. There are things that she should have done better. I would argue, for example, that she never created a coherent message for why she should be president. Why should I vote for her? Trump's message, whether you agreed with it or not, was coherent. I'm going to change things. I'm going to make America great again. Whether or not you buy that as valid, it clearly spoke to what was on people's minds. And I'm not sure she was able to do that. And, and the sad thing is, she had a lot of time to get ready with that. So a lot of things happen. Sometimes I think that campaign was too smart by half. <clears throat> campaigning in places they shouldn't have been versus campaigning in places where they really needed to win. So I, I, but I think it's a valid point. But to the issue of sexism and women, women, women candidates, though, I mean, and it's, maybe it's because we're old, but we were kind of astonished by what we were seeing from millennial women who were largely for Bernie in the primary, who seemed to us to not get what a big deal it was that, Hillary. that there would be a woman president. And the only thing that we could sort of account for it in, in data was that so many of them had been born after Roe v. Wade, and that that was such a marker in the culture about women's lives. They and, assumed that their lives would be... And, and Title, title nine. nine. That's a good point, yeah. And that somehow this opportunity would come along right away again. Or she just wasn't the right one, or something like that. And I do think that, I mean, she, she definitely did not run well among millennials. And there were a lot of Bernie millennials who just didn't, didn't bother to vote. So again, you know, there's a lot of reasons why she lost. But that always struck me as a strange strange thing and and um and, but, and and sort of went into our our analysis of kind of scratching our head about there, why there's why a number of women there's a number of women by the way out there uh, uh, uh kristen gillibrand clara mccaskill uh, amy klobuchar uh who have big national profiles elizabeth warren obviously 
who are extremely polished uh, and, and very likable characters, whether or not any of them has the political skill to put together the money base and the, the, the donor base and the, uh, the political base to, to win the nomination or uh, to, to, to defeat an incumbent president, I have no idea. Did you find Carly uh, likable in those times? You think she was likable? Yeah. Let me ask you. Well, let me ask you. Were, were we defensive enough in response to that question? <laughs> I wasn't defensive. I blamed it on women. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I, I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I know I did, but. Um, <laughs> Please join me in thanking our, our guests here. Today. Thank you. Thank you. Um this on? Yeah. Uh, and thanks, Mark and Kevin, for uh, leading that discussion. Uh, thank you to Dignity Health Sequoia Hospital for sponsoring uh, this morning's general session. Thank you so much to the, our signature sponsor, Facebook. Uh, and definitely, let's give a hand to um, our progress seminar chairs. Carol Groom, Roseanne Faust, and Kevin Mullen. And finally, and finally, of course, our wonderful chamber staff, uh, Samantha Maloa, and those two roller skating pink ladies, Amy Buckmaster and Carolina Webster. Again, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Drive safely, and we'll see you next year.